let's uh, let's get going here. Okay, as you know, our, in our last meeting we had a uh, uh, School of Architecture faculty member and, and Boston architect Tim Love. Um, we talked about a, a design process that is geared to um, wildly varied constituencies. As you remember from Tim's presentation, um, de the design of the Boston Harbor Islands Pavilion was really not just a single answer to a question. It had to answer six or seven wildly different questions. And one of the things uh, that I took away from that talk anyway was that he was very self-conscious about trying to resist synthesis or resist pulling all of the stuff together until the very, very end of the process. In other words, wanted to make clear, you know, he, he talked about decontextualizing or disaggregating the component parts of the uh, Harbor Islands Pavilion, the communication parts, the transactional parts, the roof parts, and all the rest, uh, the map parts, uh, the siting, and all of that, um, until at the very end they brought it together. But before that, no. Um, so uh, I, I thought that was a really uh, helpful thing, and I think we'll talk about that perhaps a bit more today with our guest. And let me uh, introduce our guest, uh, Peter Dixon, a, a senior partner and creative director at Profit Incorporated in New York City. He brings a unique blend of perspectives as an architect and brand specialist. It translates into an, an imaginative take on identity, branding, and design expressed in both high-level thinking and visual representations. Peter's award-winning programs have spanned all areas of the brand experience, ranging from building design to retail concepts and merchandising systems. He has worked with such notable clients as BMW, Citibank, Chrysler, Delta Airlines, eMart, IBM, Microsoft, McDonald's, Nissan, Sprint, Samsung, United Airlines, United Health Group, and Walmart. So obviously he's the beginner. Um, Peter is a popular public speaker and is often tapped as a source by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Brand Week, Newsweek, Visual Merchandising and Store Design. My favorite. And here, which is always on my desk. Uh, convenience Store News at Advertising Age. Please join me in welcoming Peter. Thanks, George. Um, I, so I, I got a peek at the list of other speakers that you've had here. And uh, you know it's really an auspicious group. And I'm, I'm really honored to uh, to be part of this and and to talk about design from uh, yet another kind of uh, angle. Uh, I work in a field of design that generates things that people usually don't think are designed. So it's kind of design that operates in the background of culture and background of society. Um, sometimes in the foreground of, of things when you, s you see a lot of it, it, a lot of it's out there in the world, um, but people don't even know that it's actually a, a job, that it's something that you do. And actually to find this occupation was a bit of a journey. And so I'm going to show, I'll talk a little bit about my accidental journey to finding this way of designing in the world. And then I'll, I'll show some of the work that we do and hopefully we'll have a conversation about some of that process. I'll, I'll pause kind of midstream and talk about process and and how you know, going from architecture school into the world of branding required a big leap in the thinking about why we design things a certain way. And hopefully I can share that with you today. So I started out as an engineer um, building this kind of stuff. And a mechanical engineer, and it was a lot of codes and a lot of constraints and a lot of physics and a lot of hydrology and, and a lot of things that kind of drove to why things look like this. Completely functional, you know, not one ounce of thought into the way things looked. Um, it was an interesting problem-solving exercise, and, and you know, it, it took me to some funny places in the world where you'd, they'd show up with a bar that looked like that, and we'd build the, the stuff that I just showed you. So it was really a kind of intense kind of design-build process, but also it was a way of going out into the world and, and seeing parts of the world that I probably would never have seen growing up in New Orleans as a, as a kid playing, you know, catching crawfish in the ditch. Um, after that engineering ex uh, kind of experience, though, I, I really had found like there was something missing in what I was doing. I kind of got bored with it um, and didn't want to be my boss working on a barge in Dubai. Um, 
So I went back to school, and I went back to the University of Texas and did a lot of the kind of stuff that architecture students do. You draw stuff, and you design things, and you learn about problem solving in a different way, and you draw with ink on mylar, and then, of course, in, in the 80s, when I was in school, you did a lot of spray paint and, and chipboard, and you made things that hopefully were bringing an idea forward that you were very passionate about, and, you know, design, you know, wh while being interesting, and, and it left me some questions about why I was designing a certain way. I don't know about, I don't know if you have the same questions about design, um, but then when I went to school, went to work, I went to work in New York for Skidmore and Merrill, and, you know, at the time, you know, the senior partner there was very interested in kind of this kind of postmodern New York 1930s thing. We did a lot of bad drawings for him. Uh, we worked on Time Warner Center. This is one of the early drawings of Time Warner Center, the tops of Time Warner Center. Three generations later, something else is built. Um, this is one of the early computer-aided rendering programs uh, that Skidmore had launched and, you know, being one of the young guys there at the time, I actually modeled some of Time Warner Center three generations before it was built. So it was all kind of fun uh, term problem solving and also, you know, again, why to design things a certain way. Um, Strathmore modeling for Skidmore, you know, the, the in a courtyard of Time Warner Center. And then the West Side Highway, the bridge over to Stuyvesant Town. This was... Uh, you know, this is where it started. It doesn't look anything like this now. But again, I learned about the process of how things get made in the world going from design to things that are built. Um, working on, you know, working in, in high rises and, and corporate design. Um, but a lot of the imagery parts of the projects were, were the parts that I really got involved in. This is a canopy, a media canopy for the Bertelsmann Building in New York. Before it was really easy to do media signs in, in uh, on buildings. And then uh, spent a short time working with my mentor, um, Artie Matlock at Perkins and Will in doing some other corporate design work. So that was all, you know, I guess a typical path of, you know, you, you do something in life and you change, you know, change jobs and you do something you really like. And I fell in love with architecture, school and work. But there was always this question in my mind about it, which was, why does it look like this? Really, why does it look like it looks? And, you know, very unsatisfying answers came out of school where the way it looked always kind of was because of the interest of the professor. That, you know, if they were interested in history, it was historic. If they were interested in technology, it was somehow technological. If they were interested in literary criticism, it could look like anything, right? It was really an interesting time of, of okay, uh, I can do this. I can use this as a way of designing. I said, but, you know, when I get out of school, it's going to be different. You know, there'll be real reasons to design things. And then when I went to New York, and, I, you know, the senior partner was interested in New York 1930. Everything looked like New York 1930. And I realized, no, it's not any different. Things are looking like they look because who's in charge is actually saying what it's going to look like. That bridge over the West Side Highway now looks like a, a railroad bridge with a lighthouse next to it. And they, all they did wanted was a simple pedestrian bridge. Because, at the time, the guy in charge thought that a lighthouse and a railroad bridge would be better. So it wasn't until I stumbled into this field of branding that I got a clue another way to design. So in this role, I ended up doing, still designing things that had a lot of little intricate parts and pieces, a lot of imagery-baked kind of ideas. This was a car show for BMW back in the 90s. Um, and all the little bits and pieces that were really great and fun design that was based on an idea that actually wasn't my idea. And it wasn't my company's idea. It was actually the idea of BMW. And so Jörg Zinsmeyer is a Swiss-German guy, no longer with us, but he was my boss at the time. And in his funny kind of German, you know, broken English way, he, he would say, identity is a process by which values are made realizable. And in, as he talked about identity, he was saying what we today talk about as brand. That the way things look, they feel, the way they sound, come from the values of the subject. That completely changed design for me. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about what I liked. It wasn't about my values. It was about the values of the subject. I have great debates with my design team about this all the time. I get designers who believe that design is self-expression and that this self-expression comes from their heart and their passions. And I love their heart and their passions. But that's art. And I believe art has its place in the making of things. I love it. I learn a lot from it. But in design, I found a great power in using the values of the subject to drive design. 
So after my introduction to that, I worked for a company in New York called Lippincott, where I was creative director for 13 years, and took this idea of translating strategic insight into experience through that lens of the client's issues, values, desires, and actually did a lot of eh, kind of interesting work. Um, there's a process that I want to talk about a little bit in part of this is this notion of aspiration, immersion, ideation in a kind of iterative sense and realization that is something that underlies all the work I'm going to show you. The aspiration being important in that what you want to do, what the client wants to do is often really undefined. And the idea of understanding what the aspiration is before you start anything is actually really important and something that it took a long time to learn that understanding what we're really trying to do, really trying to do, was actually the first step. Immersion takes on a lot of aspects, you know, inspiration elements of it, uh, uh, really understanding what the utility is of place, you know, what are the, the cultural inputs, the marketplace inputs. A lot of things go into this, and I think that all of us have different processes for bringing things to a design assignment. Then the, the kind of ideation and validation kind of iteration we go through all the time. I was talking to George recently. He was mentioning the idea of fast failure. I think you guys have talked about recently. And, you know, uh, as, you know, running a design studio, I'm often, I kind of get to watch my designers work. So especially the graphic designers who have these big screens in front of them. And if you watch them for an hour or so, I know it's kind of creepy to say I might watch them, but, you know, they, they're used to it now. It is about watching them fail constantly. Try this, fail, try this, fail, try, fail, try, fail. Fail a hundred times before everyone goes, ah, it works. And they put this out. Then they start failing again. So graphic designers work in a failure, fast failure mode all the time. I don't know if they even think about that as a process, but it is indeed a process. Uh, and the realization of how actually I love being able to get things in the world, get them made, get them being part of, of uh, people's lives. One of the techniques that's interesting I'll talk a little bit about today for that process is experience mapping. And it's a way, I think, of taking the notion of empathy and actually making it part of the process. That this is about walking in the user's shoes, the audience, the customer, walking in their shoes and understanding what they want, what they need from the experience you're designing. So I think this translates really well to interiors and architecture, but I've used it to be more largely around how you interact with a company in a branding idea, whether it's communications or experiences. This is a typical map for that idea where you map the path of users. Um, this was for a, a, a hotel experience idea um, where you actually have literal ex experience objectives for each of these kind of disaggregated parts. I believe that was another topic that you guys talked about in terms of disaggregation of the issues so you can really concentrate on them, really understand what they are, and then bring, bring in our case, branding ideas to activate each of those what we call touch points. And so this mapping technique is really kind of underlying what we do. But it's no more, I mean, it's not rocket science. It's really about walking in the shoes of the user and understanding what they want, want to feel in different parts of an experience. It will change the way you design, by the way, if you take that attitude. If you take, a, if you take that path with them and understand what, what needs to happen at all the constituent parts of an experience, you will understand what you need to do, what you need to design. And it's not about what you like. It's not about what you want to do. It actually really kind of brings to life those things that will make the user experience more relevant. But what that does is really create, it doesn't design it for you, it creates the criteria for driving design. So the work that I'll talk about today will be all very much criteria driven. We all establish this criteria before we draw one thing. You know, what's the criteria both from a functional standpoint, but what's the criteria from the emotional standpoint? What's the criteria for how you want people to feel at each of these aspects of an experience or through the communications that you're creating for them. So it's been a really great process. I mean, I've been doing it for 20 years now. And it's allowed me to, you know, really have an understanding of what we should be doing as a team. But more importantly, it allows my clients to know what they're doing. This is a very transparent process. It kind of takes the guru aspect out of things and really makes it be something that they can participate in. Very important part of success of the work I'll show you was that clients were involved. The people you were doing this for were part of this and actually did it along with this because they had a vested interest in it. And I had one, besides the fee, I had one in that we want something to show up in the world that works. And I think that collaboration between client and my team and green things have put a lot of interesting things in the world.
What kind of things? Well, like a grocery store. Now, this is a grocery store concept that's now 15 years old. It's in Vancouver. When they came to us with this, uh, the, the company that owns this, this uh, grocery store is called Overweighty Food Company. And we thought for sure it's going to be a name change project. But indeed, it was the Overweight Tea Company, Overweighty Foods, was a, just their heritage was about as being tea importers, giving that little extra measure of tea. And there's kind of a generosity Im imbued in their organization. Um, but they are Western Canada's uh, largest grocer. And this was a new concept for them that was going to be kind of a very basic, uh, you know, focus on the food, not so much decoration around the, the grocery store uh, idea 15 years ago. And uh, it's still pretty, uh, there's a half dozen of them out there. Most of them retrofits of this type. But you'll see this idea of the concept and the retrofit of the elements to something that's already existing. And a lot of the work will show. Because oftentimes in this field, you don't get to do things from scratch. You're actually applying it to an installed base, if you would, of facilities, experience, communications that you need to work with. Banks. This was a, a bank in, uh, in, Bo in Boston for um, Citizens Bank and RBS Bank, where we took a much more retail idea, emotional idea, to activate typical financial services jargon like grow and to make people question what that word means by putting this kind of very emotional, large-scale graphic treatments in those environments. And it won some awards. This, believe it or not, is the headquarters of Radio Shack. This was a, a kind of an a ex exhibition space that talked about the emerging technologies uh, and how they would be used around the home. So you see kind of a, the garage where the mobility projects were, products were demonstrated, um, some personal electronics, the home office idea. So it's kind of an interesting, rich environment around not so much the technology of the future, but the technology of today that was available to Radio Shack's customers. On more global scale, um, car dealership concepts for, for some big brands, Nissan's global uh, car dealership was a really an architecture project married to some serious product design ideas. Trying to take the same cues from the product design that were emerging in their studios and apply that to um, uh, a building design. And where the idea of transparency and the kind of, you know, we're, we're not going to try to hide the, the bad service department from you anymore and opening up the facade, facade of the pavilion and, and clearly marking where service interest was. Some very basic things brought to life through those concepts. And a kit of parts that allow us to apply this to a lot of places that already existed. And so these are all things all over the world. Just, you know, you see them run into them all the time. Where we've taken a simple idea of this, this kind of these louvers and metal panels and the color and, and kind of reapplied them on a lot of existing buildings to uh, generate uh, this brand image. For the same company, their luxury brand, we created this form, again, tying into principles of the product design. You see some of the, the, the product design kind of sweep of the, of the top and the curvature of the car kind of built into this, this language, again, with not so much transparency this time, but trying to build a little bit of mystery and intrigue about what's inside. And this kind of this glowing facade and the, and the kind of the, the kind of intrigue of this to bring you into the environment, part of the brand idea. Again, not our idea, but a brand idea activated in built form. This was the prototype in Seoul. Um, funny enough, we had to build a vertical version of that horizontal concept because of the size of the land uh, available in Seoul. And this was kind of this very sort of modern luxury type environment, much more akin to a hotel, frankly, than a car dealership. And then some work that you, you'll see a lot of around here. In 2003, uh, me and my team were hired to re-image McDonald's restaurants and to break away from the mansard roof and develop new ideas that kind of brought them into the next century. And interiors that were much more about being in the interior than, than just driving by the outside. Um, again, the retrofit idea. These are elements that could be brought to the existing types of facilities that actually re-image them in ways that made them seem more at quality and a little bit more uh, you know, part of the, the landscape. So these are, again, the retrofit ideas of, uh, of that, even in the drive through special little elements that kind of tied the site together. New interiors, which you already see here. In the, about four or 5,000 locations have been re-imaged in the US today. And then Walmart. So this was a really difficult project. And the, the, the goals of Walmart about trying to do things better, you know, they say it, they're really trying to 
reimagine the business they're in. And over the last couple of CEOs, this is because it's kind of wavered back and forth. But the reimaging aspect, our job, you know, modernizing them, making them more acceptable in the suburbs and the cities of, of this country, and actually doing it with very simple means: color, topography, and signs. It's really kind of an architecture project that transformed this big box with some very basic elements. And you'll see the new ones have a much more friendly environment, a very different feel uh, for shopping, and a kind of a way that's starting to transform them. And the interesting part of this is what's happening you don't see in the store, about internally what's happening about this notion of helping people live better is something they actually take seriously. And you'll see them you know, evolve over the next 10 years in some, I think, some positive ways. Um, Delta Airlines. So in the reimage of Delta Airlines uh, five or six years ago now, the, the, you know, as emerging from bankruptcy, using simple elements of visual system to start to translate, but innovation as well. I mean, if you start to see what they're doing with their gates and the, uh, the bringing the idea of a club right to the gate and, and to, you know, participating more broadly in people's amenities as they fly on the ground, uh, this program was really an activation of that. And then right now, uh, we're working with, uh, you know, Maserati and, again, doing more architecture and some simple building design ideas. Uh, but then more broadly, trying to reinvigorate some existing brands like Timex, where we're trying to, you know, kind of make it a little bit more relevant today and, and, and more so that there are more products that they can bring into people's lives. Some of the systematic way you, you create these uh, uh, guidelines for their internal teams to use. E-Mart is uh, a big discount uh, retailer in Korea where we kind of reinvigorate um, them with this idea of everyday value and, and the everyday and take this new visual language into um, all the different touch points and create for them as a side project um, a health and beauty format called Booms um, where again a kind of a younger um, uh, but, but a little bit more uh, sort of a little bit science behind the, the idea of, uh, of health and beauty in the product design. Visual, uh, got imaging visual information uh, for this group of, of Citibank that is about doing finance in, in countries and cities, municipalities that, uh, you know, really help to grow infrastructure. So it's about helping a, a country design a new water system and doing the financing for that or a new bill, bill payment system and, and helping uh, do the innovation and, and finance uh, work around those things, and, and then activating that in a more infographic way. Ooh. Where we're using the basic elements of a, of a visual system to, to talk about what they do in cities. So I was going to end with a kind of a failure, a big failure, um, for a company called AMD. Um, they're the second largest chip manufacturer. They operate in you know, most parts of the world, but they're really sort of in the shadow of Intel, the big, big dog in that category. And you know, the problem is that they, when they could try to compete with this company, they are actually you know, at a detriment across every aspect of the business, every aspect of the brand except for cost. They actually do make lower cost chips. So we tried to find a way that we could use that one little advantage to help reposition them, not so much as the ingredient brand that they are, kind of, you know, as Intel Inside is, but actually become more of a partner in delivering technology to a world where this idea of low cost and low power will make a lot of sense. So trying to link this value that they can bring to the world to their own unique advantage or, you know, disadvantage to make it be something completely new. So rather than just being an a, a, a ingredient, to become part of the experience of people, to team with uh, OEMs or, or manufacturers to then create new products that are particularly right for the emerging world, emerging markets. So to be part of people's lives, not part of the machine. And I would, there's a nice video here for this, but we're not going to play, I don't think, right? No, not. Um, but then activating this through a new visual identity and a way of positioning them in the world that says they're going to be, you know, again, part of, of, of the uh, devices, but in a way that's not just as an ingredient, but as a development partner and be 
you know, relevant in these places of the world where technology is going to be playing a big part of growth in people's lives. Anyway, that was a big failure because as we won this project, the CMO, a new CMO came in and thought they weren't ready for this. And so even though in this case we thought it really was a great expression of their values and what they could be, um, it's not to be. Anyway, okay. thanks. Thank you a great place to start, actually, the, 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 um, that this failure bit, because um, it actually ties into another one of our eight words, and that, in a way, is, is leadership, because it sounds like you guys were proposing or working with them to come up with a new identity, not only for the outside, but for the inside of the company, really a strategic vision and identity for the company. Um, now, how does that, I mean, we're, we're getting into like my, the, the tenth question I had scripted already, but it's it's okay. Uh, how does that happen? In other words, you were hired, presumably by them. What was the task you guys were given at AMD? To reposition them. Okay. To what can we do because we're losing in every possible way to Intel. Right. Right. And to try to figure out a way that they could, you know, take some of their realities and make them advantage. Right. Right. So this is very, you know. For those of us, you know, there, there are some of the um, examples we've looked at in this course already where you can imagine, well, all the important decisions have already been made. It's a question of what's the thing going to look like. This is not that at all. This is a core, this is like design as the identity of what this multi-billion dollar It was dollar a business company. idea as much as it was an identity idea. Right. As a business idea that where they could win as a company would be in to partner with device manufacturers, right. not as just being the chip, but going out and seeking which ways low power and low cost could change people's lives and de making devices that worked in that context. Right, right. So they, uh, but it, ultimately this was just too much change for that company? Yeah. It was like, because that, it's rather than, it's like going from being in the uh, a perennially number two in the first world, but to... Just being a different kind of category. Yeah. You know, being more of a, you know, actually device partner. Right. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a big idea and we, we did it with them. We had access to all their senior executives and their engineers and and it was uh, kind of inspirational to so many of those engineers when we actually unveiled this I wish we could play the video but yeah, the, um, yeah. the, uh, the the so the, at, at the grassroots level there's a super appetite for this idea of rethinking what they're in but the management so used to being I believe in that secondary category as an ingredient just mm -hmm. trying to be like Intel mm -hmm. uh, weren't able to kind of see beyond that that happens sometimes and mm -hmm. you know all the great projects that you can do in, in whatever field you're in, it really is highly dependent on having great clients. You know? Right, right. Well, I mean, that's one of the things that, that I, you know, we were talking about before uh, class started that, that you know, we, I think, are teasing out some real common elements to what you do versus what Marsha Lawson, I don't know if you know Marsha, she's in, at University of Illinois, Chicago, and she's a really excellent graphic designer and also more like a... Uh, sort of, a, I would say, a bit of a design leader. She, she partnered with an architect for a, a really interesting approach to the Navy Pier, the redesign of, you know, if you want, the repositioning of Navy Pier. Yeah. But it was a, you know, the idea of design is much farther up the food chain of decision making than it's easy to imagine is, is, is I think, one of the outcomes that we've... we've I think that with. one of the only way that some of these projects have happened is because it's really way up the food chain. Yeah. It's not really ever the decoration at the end of a process. Right. It really is very much part of a business idea and how they need to change intrinsically and that the design expression becomes part of that exercise as opposed to the decoration idea. Could I also add that, and, and that this also means that it, it, your, your company is taking part in much higher value uh, decisions monetarily, in other words, the the kind of advice you guys are giving is at, at, operates at a very different uh, part of the economic spectrum than architecture does or than, than graphic well, we design d does, we definitely tra traditionally understood. We definitely talk about ourselves as consultants right. and not designers. Right. I mean, it's a, you know, we have great designers. We have, you know, we have people who operate in, in analytics and in all kind of other business um, strategy 
excellent, but together, you know, we are, you know, problem solvers and we kind of frame this as kind of high level problem solving as consultants. Yeah. You know, just as a bit of context, this is a transformation that's taken place in lots of businesses, I would say, in the last 25 years. Maybe the most, uh, the most well-known example is actually IBM, which, has, which very self-consciously turned itself from being a computer company to being a consulting company that happened to recommend computer-based solutions frequently, but, but they were... They yeah, were, uh, it's part of that dematerialization right. of value, right? I mean, the, the hardware, the software were real things, right. and, you know, they still sell a lot of that. Right. But they, you know, 75% of the revenue is in the consulting around the ideas that utilizes those right. things. But they freely sold Lenovo, what is now, what was their ThinkPad business, yeah. their, uh, to, or, and maybe their entire... Um, uh, they still make the big hardware servers and... But, and not, but not the consumer. Personal, not anything yeah, for consumers. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's pretty telling, it seems to me. So, um, y there's so many things, that w we, w so many ways we can get started, but let's, uh, first of all, I, want, I have a note here that this whole, this notion of experience mapping, which, which I've seen before, but the business about disaggregating the experiences associated with the hotel is so great, and I think most everybody in here can probably relate to that idea. If, if understanding what is the brand of Hilton Hotels is just too complicated to think about, then break it's it impossible. into... It's impossible to have one idea express one way, deliver anything meaningful. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if I look back at when I was doing, you know, straight up architecture stuff, that would have been so helpful right. oh. in actually doing any type of of design work where you that take that sort of empathetic outsider view of the user and understand what they want to feel because it really makes you develop different ideas. Like if you walk into uh, a store mm. and you know the first thing you want people to feel is a little bit of knowing where they are, orientation. Right. Immediately it gives you reasons for circulation, for you know, wayfinding, for the actual use of, of mass and transparency to create that idea of knowing where I am. Right. You immediately you know that idea. It's, right. So it gives you a sense of what you need to do. Right. And it has nothing to do with you know, how cool this entrance is going to be. Right, right. No, no. Now you have to make it cool. Right? You have to make it be great. But now you know why it has to be like it has to be. Right. Right? And you think about that decision you make a thousand times in an experience, having that other view to create that, what, what it is you have to do, is so freeing. Right, right. Well, this is really clarifying because, you know, the whole way that many of these fields are taught is by showing the final result. Uh, when we were in architecture school, and what we do at this school is show you completed results. And, you know, it's a, 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 a little bit of an aside, but it's, it's worth it. Um, the architecture students will know um, the Phillips Exeter Academy Library by Louis Kahn uh, in Exeter, New Hampshire. Maybe some of you who are from the New England region might have encountered it. It's a very famous piece of modern architecture. I took some students there maybe 10 years ago. And, I don't know, I called somebody, I got a in, I, I was nice to the librarian, something like that. She said, well, you know what, you just have a small group. Come on downstairs to the basement, and I'll show you the models leading up to this final design. Now, Louis Kahn is considered like Frank Lloyd Wright or Le Corbusier or any, a great 20th century architect and incapable of error. I can only tell you this, the early, so in other words, I saw like the first five iterations of this, probably not the first five, the number 25 and number 30 and so forth, but they were so awful. They were incomprehensibly bad. Um, and I couldn't believe it. They were the sort of thing uh, where you, so you looked at it and you thought, well, gosh, you know, I would, I'd give that person a C minus and, you know, say they should consider doing something else. Um, and this is one of the greatest architects of the 20th century. The point is that, that we are used to looking only at the end result. And this whole, I, I'm, I'm getting a, uh, I've been toying around with what our second writing assignment is going to be in this class. And it, something tells me that um, doing um, experience mapping might be a really good thing for everybody to take a stab at. In other words, disaggregating an experience that you all are very familiar with and having to articulate, observe, research, assess, and articulate what are the actual experiences in each one of those um, aspects. And I'm thinking about doing it for the School of Architecture, too. <laughs> um, 
Well, that's so. So that's that's super interesting. Um, now, do, how can you give us some other examples of how you get, you guys do experience mapping in most of the things that you do? Almost everything. Yeah. I, I you know if it's just if it's all completely visual, it's a little bit more limited. You know, you think about you know the the applications on web mm -hmm. are different than on print and different out of home and broadcast. You think about those as different ways of engaging, and so that drives a lot of the functionality of type selection and colors that work in different media. And you do a little bit of that. Because it's usually a touch point, I, you know, this communication idea, what do you want people to feel when they see this expression of the company, right? right? That, that's kind of a one of the touch points. But there's a lot of intricacies to even the single touch point. Right. But for anything that we do in hospitality or in retail or, you know, any, any, of, any of these kind of more uh, dimensionalized experiences, exhibits, right. Uh, right. we often do it. You know, what, is it, what, is it, what do you want to feel like when you're, you know, at a distance, when you right. just enter? when you're looking at content. You know, what do you want these things to feel like? And it really changes the criteria for the design of all these things. Right. And it becomes, also it becomes a way for you to communicate to your client right. what the hell you're doing. Right. Right? Right. It makes it not as mysterious. That that they're afraid of design. Most right. clients that we work with are afraid of design. Of course. They, they, they think it's magic. Or Some kind of magic. And I, this, in a way, you know, demystifies it so that they get, oh, okay, so one of our attributes is really about um, uh, comfort, okay, mm -hmm. comfort. So that's why the lighting is like this here. That's why the materials are like mm -hmm. this here. That's why the seating is, you know. So you, you take those things and, and show the connection between the word right. and actually what you're going to do. Right. And they get super excited about it. They start participating and saying, why don't we try this? Or, you know, they, they understand the process so much more, and that's when it's really fun. Right, right. Well, this, this should ring a bell because I think what uh, Tim Love was talking about last time in terms of disaggregating the Harbor Islands thing. I, 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 I'll, I'll try. To, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll send you the video of it because it's, it's, uh, it's really clarifying, at least for me. Because in this case, as is the case, I'm sure with a lot of your things, there's different kinds of customers. There's different kinds of users. They're not all coming from the same place, and so you have to kind of map, probably for more than one kind Absolutely. of. Absolutely. I mean, you saw there in that one diagram there were two kind of user journeys. Right. Um, oftentimes there are you know multiple, you know, ten, twenty different right. types of, you know, hotels are, are is a perfect example where you have, that was for a casino hotel, so there were gamblers and non-gamblers, right. very different experiences. Right, right, right. Um, you know, when you have, you know, kids and you have old people and you have people who are in business, people who are for leisure, all these different ways have different, bring different mindsets and right. experience expectations right, right. to, uh, to the, the use and that changes. So you do have to create things that are either very particularized for a user or actually general enough that it meets the needs of many. Right. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I've been to Las Vegas only twice in my life, but one time, and I'm not a gambler. It's one of the few problems I don't have. And uh, uh, it was really notable that there were two completely different ways to occupy this thing called the hotel at Mandalay Bay. Mm -hmm. And it was like there were two completely different hotels. Two, everything was different. If you were, it was like there was a fork in every road. Are you planning to dump a bunch of money on a table? If so, go this way. Anyway. I, I, I completely believe that. Um, now, you, this business about empathy, you know, of all the people I've talked with about this course, you use it most often and with absolutely no reservation whatsoever. In other words, it's, uh, it's like the core of, of, of our eight words, it seems to me, it's like the core one for you, that, that getting inside what the consumer, the user yeah. is about. Yeah, that was a big change, you know, from, you know, designing objects in school that I was, you know, sculpting, mm -hmm. you know, um, in, at, at, in, in practice and in architectural practice, you know, the making of the deadline and bringing the image that the senior partner had mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. thing were, mm -hmm. you know, paramount to the making of, of the, thing. sometimes the functionality and the structure, you know, were how, but it really, there was no discussion about no why things looked like they look or anything and, and uh, so this idea of this the user driving this and, and, the, and you know, the, who the client is, understanding that and that generating the idea. I mean, you know, the idea of brand is a little bit, you know, people kind of hate it usually when mm -hmm. I talk about it because it does seem sort of nefarious in mm -hmm. some way. Mm -hmm. But it is actually a, a, a kind of a nice handle for this notion of activating ideas mm -hmm. in a particular way. 
Right. I mean, it's really about the particularization of how you could do things a lot of different ways, but a brand idea has this idea of identity and utility and empathy right. that hopefully works hand in hand. I mean, you, you, if you're designing a store for someone, you're trying to make the store work as a store right. for both right. the client and, right. the, and the customer. And right. so you have to understand how, how it has to work for both to make that right. happen. Right. That's, that's, that's really great. Um, so let me so let me just um, zoom out to um, something else here, which is um, how you guys actually work. You know, I've been down to your office a couple of times, I guess, and of course you have a kind of, I would say, a, a, a sort of contemporary type of workspace. That is, it's not a bunch of cubicles, it's not just a maze of offices. You want to talk a little bit about how you how you guys work both physically and then and how you, let's say, I come into your I'm a new client of yours, and we're ha you know we're having our first meeting, you know. But why don't you talk about the the kind of space you guys work in and how you I, work? You in know, it. to me, this was the f the first real multidisciplinary environment. You know, when I got into branding, it, it was really about multidisciplinary work together, collaboration, right. in a real way. I mean, I, I you know I've been on architecture projects where they're the 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 designers the the drafting guys, then there's the engineers, and then there's consultants, and there's the real estate. You know, I've been in those kind of collaborative meetings where it seems like it's collaborative, but they're in a way, they're kind of taking care of their own thing. That's right. And we have a kind of manufacturing division of labor process in this country that we, everybody does their own thing and it goes together. And it, it works to some degree, and it's efficient. Mm -hmm. I, in, the, in the branding world, I find that it's actually much more integrated. Mm -hmm. The consultants doing the business planning or, or the business idea research for like AMD, understanding right. about their manufacturing and the low cost actually enabling lower cost devices in the third world would be a great, you know, that kind of business thinking right alongside, you know, uh, graphic designers who are saying, we know we can actually show, we can explain that, we can bring that to life by, you know, by showing actually these devices in use and having the client jump to see what we're talking mm -hmm. about in mm -hmm. terms of enablement. So you see the, the graphics of that idea, you know, really activating the notion of low-cost devices in emerging markets. Right, right. So that happens like sooner. And we have innovation teams, we have analytics teams, we have you know, writers. And, you know, so it's a nice collaborative environment. And so that office that you see, it's just an open plan office, is really trying to make those unintentional moments of collaboration happen. Mm -hmm. and the only way you know who's who is that you can tell the designers have the big screens right, and right, the right. consultants have the little screens. You can, look <laughs> across, you can see how they're all mixed up and, right. and working together. And that's, in theory, you know, we, we're you know, three or four years into that experiment, um, but it's been uh, working pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, a, you know, that's just as an aside, you know, we had Charlie Laser in from Blue Dot Furniture and Flat Pack uh, Prefab Homes and so forth. But they have also done some... Um, uh, you know, a, a custom office space for, you know, innovative firms in the Minneapolis area. And it's interesting because those examples were the only one-off kind of designs that he showed. The entire thing was about uh, scalable, repeatable mm -hmm. stuff. And then when he, got to, when he got to making space for innovation, well, no, no, that has to be uh, sculpted out of clay. <laughs> and I thought... I thought that was interesting, but but the the workplace is becoming dramatically transformed yet again to try to I think encourage this kind of oh yeah no that's complete change. I mean, if you want to read about that, you know Herman Miller Steel Case have done some great studies on that in a very sort of way. But I think it's really cool to to see how the business of the workplace is actually catching up to a creative collaborative idea. Right. I, I I you know part of the branding expression sometimes for a company is their workplace mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. not putting the logo on the wall mm -hmm. but actually creating the environment that's supposed to bring their values to life. Right. Right. So right. that's a really you know if you're designing for a company that I think should be one of the you know one of the starting points is how do you make their values manifest as opposed to picking a cool furniture system. Right. Right. No, that's such a great point. When um, and it's also one of the reasons why. Um, the business proposition of interior design, when it is doing that kind of cor well done, is much more lucrative than, than architecture by itself. When architecture is doing a commodity, right. and when um, interior design is doing something more akin to what profit does, which is, you know... Uh, and it makes related. sense, too, if you think about, if you're doing something that is an expression of themselves, right. 
they will pay more for it. I mean, they definitely want they want that to be, you know, it elevates them somehow. And so, of course, he has a premium, mm -hmm. you know, uh, fee structure around that kind of consulting as opposed to, you know, specking the carpet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know. Well, it's interesting. We could have a, in a different class, we'd have a larger conversation about how that, and we have some graduate students right now who are doing some detailed research on how, um, how that has changed in buildings so dramatically over the last hundred years. So that, like, in the 1920s and 30s, you have a building like the Chrysler Building, which was actually architecture all about brand identity. Completely, yep. <laughs> and now, no, the buildings generally are more uh, generic containers in which there will be a well-designed brand-related series of floors, but, mm -hmm. not, but not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. anyway. Very seldom, I think, because again, I think the architects still are building the vision of the senior partner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really are, and and again, you know, very seldom you see. You know, there are some architects though who do who do this though. Jean Nouvel, mm. I think, totally understands the problem, generates the solution. But uh -huh. right? I think he's one of the ones out there. In the past, I think Renzo Piano has been that. Right. right. I think uh, going back, Saarinen. Right. Saarinen right. probably the best example from, you know, the, the emergence of modernism here, right. who actually reinvented architecture for each big assignment, right. and it was fantastic to see that kind of thinking and. You know, that's, that's, again, I go back and think about branding. I think those guys you know, definitely, that's what they do. Well, I mean, you know, we, we, I, I promised the uh, non-architects in the room that we're not going to uh, segue into too long of a, uh, a, a discussion on uh, mid-century architectural history. But the uh, TWA uh, terminal uh, at LaGuardia uh, by Saren okay. is the epitome of what you're describing, right? Mm -hmm. The whole thing was, what, was that. Um, now, um, I guess we kind of talked about this, but, but um, Mar when Marsha Lawson was here, um, she talked about the need for design leadership and, you know, and, and how designer ne designers needed to take a larger role in, uh, in, in leading society towards good quality solutions. And, of course, running in the face of that is often the... Um, the idea that, well, no, designers actually respond, react to a commission, to, uh, to being hired or something uh, like that. Do you, I, I assume that your firm is almost exclusively in that situation where you're being asked to respond to a problem, or are you called in to help identify what the problem is that needs to be? Well, oftentimes that first phase, this aspiration idea, to really understand what they want, because what they've asked for is not necessarily what they want. Right, right. And uh, helping them find out what that is is often a big, you know, important part of the project. Right, right, right. Yeah, but I, I think, but just, just touch on something there about, you know, design is often reactive mm -hmm. to a given set of problems, constraints, assignments. I think the design gets to be higher order in that phase. Mm -hmm when somebody comes to you with an idea of solving this problem and that you say, okay, before we solve that problem, let's, let's really kick the tires on if that's really the problem we're solving. Right, right, right. And then you often are, are, are able to open up a whole other area of, of work and thought that makes, the, makes what they wanted better. Right, right, right. right? And I think that, you know, I mean, I, I work in a very commercial practice area, but we also get to do a lot of pro bono work. Right? And we get to like, we're working for Orbis, the sort of like eye doctors without borders mm -hmm. guys. And, you know, they wanted some new brochures, right? And, w and looking at what they did, you know, what they really needed to do was to make the process for getting the patients to the airport where the operating theater was mm -hmm. easier. Mm -hmm. So in that way, you know, that we needed to create ways for the teams that transported in, uh, mostly kids, kids to this, these eye doctors, um, in a way that would be non-threatening. That would be, you know, I'm going to actually this, this is going to be a great experience, and right. and kind of pushing it away from the brochures that they wanted right, about right, this. Right, right, right. And you know, the plane itself, the plane on the on the tarmac where the operating theater is, making that be also, uh, you know, kind of uh, inspirational to uh, people coming to, you know, when that plane is in town. Okay, let's get you know, let's get wow. the kids there or something. So that kind of making it a bigger problem right, right. is is you know oftentimes the the challenge. Sometimes it's sometimes we fail at it miserably. Like for Stellastic, they were launching an e-reader, mm -hmm. and this e-reader was we we had imagined this beautiful 
red, like a nook type device mm -hmm. that would immediately make children's books and literature globally accessible to any, anybody. Low just like the AMD thing would have been a low cost, bespoke device for scholastic reading materials, right? Mm -hmm. Wrong. So we couldn't, you know, even though we tried to make the problem be that, mm -hmm. they just wanted some desktop, you know, right, kind right. of look and feel for something that, you know, that it's already obsolete, right? right? right so right. sometimes you fail at, at it, but it's still worth the exercise of trying to get what the fun, of, of push the aspiration mm. before you do the, the work. Right. What you're calling aspiration, I think we've previously called questioning the question or yes. trying to make sure that it, it, it is, you're actually at the right point on the food chain of the question. That's right. Um, so we've spoken a lot about, um, with, with almost all of our guests, um, about the difference between um, prototypical and one-off stuff. Given the kind of work you guys do, I would think it's almost always prototypical. Always. Yeah, because the whole enterprise is about being scalable, and those companies that you're talking about are not doing one, a one-off retail no. thing. For the most part, no. It's and it, and it's funny, you know. I have I have friends who do museums and mm -hmm. they do a courthouse and mm -hmm. they do these things and they're pretty, you know, pretty nice assignments, you know. Um, but I've always found great excitement in doing a gas station, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where there'll be two thousand of them, right? Mm -hmm. At the West Coast, you see a Chevron gas station with those lights and the and the new pumps and all that, you mm -hmm. know. So happy we did that. We cleaned it up. We made it more energy efficient. We did mm -hmm. all kind of real things that actually, I think, improved it, made it safer. Um, but there are a thousand of them, right, mm -hmm. or more. <laughs> and that's, that's always kind of fun. We used the first time we used LED lighting in a gas canopy we got to use on the, on the Chevron oh gas yeah? canopies on the West Coast. Yeah. So that kind of problem solving. And, and even the, you know, the McDonald's restaurants, you know, the, the push to them to, make, to reuse those buildings. Right, even right, to, right, to not right. get them to tear them down, right, right. to figure out how to reuse the building right. it was a big accomplishment. Right, you know, we right, liked right. The, the, the problem solving we did in making that be, a, a, you know, kind of a cool thing. Not all that stuff went to the landfill. We actually got them to reuse the buildings. Right, right. That's really, that's really impressive. In fact, um, you know, one of the things that won't probably isn't obvious necessarily to everybody in here, again, for those of you who are non-designers and for those of you who are, the, uh, the whole, it, it, it's really obvious that you guys develop a kit, a, a, a tool kit for, you know, once you're trying to solve these problems, because you're not synthesizing it into a single solution right away, as, as Tim with IDEO uh, right. uh, discovered. I mean, even though they're only doing, the irony is, they went through that whole for tool one thing. Process for one building. Um, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of like, I don't know, developing a giant Granimals children's clothing system so you can send your kid to school for one day. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, part, Kid of Parts ideas, you know, have, have been really an important way of scaling ideas and to you know, marry to the kind of commercial aspects of investment in different places. Some get the full kit, some get half the kit, right, some get just right. a few pieces. And the ability to scale things is, uh, has been a highly useful exercise. But it ties nicely to that disaggregation. Right, right. Because some of the parts that are for the different parts of the experience, you know, the, the sign is one thing, and the entry is one thing, and the fixtures within the, you know, all these things kind of link to that more disaggregated uh, way of thinking. But it's also how you link them together. Right, 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 right. Right. How it looks, how it feels, the materials it uses, the color, the that becomes the thread that actually does bring that disaggregated thinking into a more holistic overall experience. You know, this is really this is really helpful. I mean, when you think about, imagine that you guys were charged with um, reimagining, uh, you know, the experience of a chain of almost anything. I don't know, uh, the Olive Garden or something like this. Um, right away, there would be different contexts in which those things occur. Let's say 40% of them are on um, the corner of big um, um, shopping mall sites, right? There's shopping behind and then there's a couple of restaurants up front. So that's one condition that would then have a number of uh, realities about it, how much parking there is, how big there and so forth. Another would be actually maybe in, in a mall. Another would be in a row of retail shops on a street, et cetera, et cetera. There, there are you can imagine those grids of situations get pretty, those kits of parts get pretty extensive. They can. They can. And the secret is to make them, the kit of parts as small as possible to do the most things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Any good system, I think, has that idea of fewest components, most utility. Right, right, yeah. right. Well, um, you know, when you talk about this gas station thing, first of all, I'm going to have to make sure I'm, I've, I've 
you didn't include that in, the, in this presentation, I don't think. No. I think you sh maybe showed it in a previous uh, yes. conversation that we've had here. But it reminds me, note to selves, we should do um, a graduate research studio on <laughs> the future of not just a gas station, but a gas station plus charging station plus oh, Zipcar yeah. plus all the various other ways that we're going to be, you know, bicycle store, all, you know, like yeah. a tra like urban transit hub, because in fact, they keep remaking the requirements for gas stations. And gas stations are the are interesting, really interesting, because in cities, they're a prototypical element w that is um, really not born of the city at all. We kind of wedge a gas station. The, the, the normal form of a gas station really grew up on the suburban highway. highway. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's been wedged into the city. But often in cities in New York and Boston and Chicago, they're the most anomalous feature of any block is the is gas station. The idea that you can make a more uh, prototypically urban one is, is would be interesting. Um, go to Korea, go to you know some of these yeah, well, that's places where they've actually honed that probably better than we have. Oh, okay. But, I, but it, it's this notion of that kind of problem solving um, that has been quite fascinating, the everyday, right, right? right. the everyday things in the world right. that you bring this other way of thinking to. Right. And it, you know, because it links to people's everyday lives and you, you know, really talk, thinking about them as you're doing these things. And it's, uh, it's uh, again, it's, it's great. Uh, I, when, I, when I see the teams that have done some of these things, go, go to the first prototypes and, you know, and then they're, Relatives start calling them about seeing them. You know, the satisfaction around you know doing things in the world like that uh, is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, and I think that this kind of conversation really helps us to understand how design is perhaps a, an ever more important uh, player in this changing world. I mean, when I think about, for me, a really, really um, transformative aspect of the 1990s and the dawn of the internet was that the notion of looking at almost anything as being a scalable, repeatable experience suddenly kind of entered people's consciousnesses. Consciousnesses. Um, um, am I right? Am I saying that right? I'm blanking on it. Anyway, um, and, it, and it's really important because there are so many things that we imagine uh, making one of, and that's the way it has always been done, and we make it we may learn some things along the way, but the economies that developed around the internet and around the idea that once I make a piece of software, it's instantaneously 100,000 pieces of software or 2 million pieces of software. Um, you know, it fly, it's, I guess it, I would say it's as much a revolution as you know, industrial production was in the world of arts and crafts and so forth, when suddenly machines and photography could suddenly make things in a way that only artisans had made them before. Well, now the idea, that scalable aspect has, has been but magnified. It's, cha it's changed, right? And, and so the idea of doing the same thing over and over and over and over in the same play everywhere right. has really changed. Right. And the methods of production are now changing so that while there will be some commonalities uh -huh. between these things, the goal is to actually make them more relevant to where they are. Right. Some sort of mass so, customization. So, so the idea that you can customize more of these things dependent on the geography, the locale, the climate, you know, the, the, the type of people that, that are in the region are all now enabled while the thinking of, of mass production got us to this idea of, of scalability. Now the same technologies and ways of thinking will get us to things that will make things be more localized, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And the ability to localize things is going to be really, you know, th the next wave of these multi-unit experiences will be connected yet very particularized. Right, right. So that very early examples of such things, um, how many of you remember, and who knows, maybe they still do this, I, I can't keep up. But when they first started coming out with, I think even before iTunes or anything like that, you could have an uh, MP3 player uh, in your hand, but you could also have one on your screen. It might not have been as good as, an, as iTunes or anything like that, but there, was, there were things called skins. Do you know what I'm talking about? You, would, you, could, you could literally say, I want my MP3 player to look like it's got alligator skin on it, or I want it to look like it's a race car, or I want it to look like a princess or whatever, whatever your demographic was. And, um, and I thought at the time, oh, 
gosh, you know, do these people not have anything else to do? <laughs> but it's, it was the first step along this path, right? Taking the, 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 the thing that was providing value, the MP3 player on your computer, remained essentially unchanged. But there were these layers that you could put on it that would make it more personalized. And the idea is that they, those layers will be less superficial and more uh, integral to your Yeah, experience. the superficiality of that idea is definitely changing too. And many of the experiences that are being designed, we do more and more in digital experience now. And the ability to particularize the experience just for you right, right. is actually, a, it's the thing. Right, it's right, the thing right. that's happening in digital experiences now. Right. Whether it's them, you know, you bought this, you may like this right. kind of suggestive right. idea of things that are happening. It's right. quite quite common. Right. To more big data driven ideas of experiences. Like you know that you heard the story of the, the woman who was getting all this mail from Target about being pregnant or all this right. infancy or childcare right. information is coming to the house and their father like flipped out and called Target and said, Quit sending my daughter this pregnancy information. Right. You know, she's she's not pregnant. She, and it turns out she was pregnant. <laughs> and they knew even before she knew. Right, right, right. Because of her buying habits and things oh they were tracking, <laughs> they knew before that. So it's a little bit scary, but <laughs> if, you, if you think about the, think about though that the, the ability. They know that I'm going to die two days from now, right? So yeah, they may, right. who knows? But but the ability to personalize things are becoming, you know, certainly commercial interest in doing that. For sure, sure. But a lot of this idea of of personalization and, and recognizing your unique qualities that are right for you right, right. are going to be enabled by some of these things. Right, right. That is that. Is, I mean, it is interesting and scary and uh, yeah. all at the same time. Uh, well, that's you know we we did we've had we had somebody who's who's really all about information design earlier on about m managing uh, big data sets and so forth, and it seems like that is a that is something that really is changing super fast. Um, okay, um, you know I I think we've talked about this the notion of uh, design as a sort of higher order uh, to communication and organization has started to emerge in this course. Um, how, you know, uh, full disclosure, uh, Peter is on the board of the School of Architecture, so I, I, I don't just see him here. But I thought I'd ask a question about that we chatted briefly about on the way in, about how maybe changing ideas about design's role in the world might impact design education. If, if you, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Um, well, I have because of the, the board participation. I, and I admire the school's sort of practical, um, you know, the, the internship kind of aspect of it, I think, is, is really great as education as a way of seeing what's out there. And, and it's kind of practitioner idea. It's a great, I think, um, asset of the school. I think the, the idea of um, some pedagogical philosophy that you bring to things, I think it's become be dangerous. You know, I've seen schools where it's so narrow right, that right. the world seems very small and, and single-minded. And I think that the more broader, you know, kind of view of, of teaching, it opens up people to figuring out things a little bit more themselves. But I, the notion that I, I, I got to around why things are like they are and the idea of more an empathetic view of the world right. being part of a right. curriculum and, and, you know, adopting some of this outside in. Right. Part of a design process, the, you know, the elements of the world and particularly users right. becoming an important part of process, right. I think is a, would be a nice element to add to the curriculum, which certainly wasn't there when I was in school. Yeah. Well, I, would, I will say, you know, when you and I were in architecture school, it was probably at the, it, it, in the, in the, of the swinging pendulum, it was as far at the, I'm only interested in what the solution looks like, end of the pendulum. Uh, as, as it had ever been, yeah. so so that uh, it's not surprising perhaps that we've moved away from that. But um, this is really clarifying. I, I wonder if we can kind of shift maybe to. I mean, I, I one thing I would encourage all of you guys to to jot down if you didn't um, when Peter was giving his presentation this sort of um, this business about um, y your five part uh, box about your process aspiration. Uh, immersion, mm -hmm. ideation, validation, and realization, I think, is um, directly analogous to our sort of eight words. This is more targeted. This is more, understandably, more sort of project specific. It's more a linear sequence of, of steps. Um, 
But uh, and we'll post this on on Blackboard so you guys will can have access to it. But I think what I'd like to do as we segue into the part where you all get involved um, is I, maybe we can use as a jumping off point the whole idea of experience mapping, which I just think is is like something I, I need to be doing all the time. Um, but do you guys, first of all, is everybody, did everybody follow what the experience mapping idea was? There's sort of a, like, maybe, uh, do you want to just go over it one more time sure. so that we can sure. kind of kickstart a conversation? So um, experience mapping is a way of disaggregating or deconstructing an experience into moments in time and space where people will be going through this, this journey or an interaction with a, you know, it could be an experience, it could be a building, it could be a, uh, you know, some other process, but it really takes these things into more manageable and, and, and to parts of, a, of an experience that you can think about more richly, rather than the whole thing at once, right? right? I mean, right. At, most experiences are made up of many, many component parts, and, and so, you know, for a hotel, the idea of, you know, even before you come to the hotel, the pre-booking and how you book it, and when you arrive, you check in, you go to your rooms, there's the gambling part, Bars and restaurants, pools, the retail, and other entertainment, and then after, even if probably how to build loyalty around these. These are all very specific ways that this resort is going to be actually interacting with their guests. And in each one of these, you know, you, you know, in terms of the the functionality you're doing. Yeah, we're not going to always be able to change the functionality, right. but we can change the way it feels. Right. And so this is a way of getting to how you want people to feel at each of these moments of truth. So, so you know, when, you, when you're checking in, if this was, this was about, this particular hotel was about um, sort of like very premium, but not very formal. Mm -hmm. So it was like a premium experience, but not formal like the Wynn or the Bellagio. Right, right, has this right. kind of Swiss formality to it. Right. This could be a little bit more casual. Right. And so when you think about that, that the size of the, the check-in desk, the height of that desk, what they're wearing, Right. You know right, what right, the right, right, you know right. what the what the, the sound should be in the room all become part of this making it more accessible. Right. 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 And so the height of the desk was a big you know part of making it feel like you're you know walking up and not behind the right, right. big desk checking in. You know, it's more accessible. Right. So those kind of minutia and big ideas come together in each of these touch points in different ways. Right. 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 right, right. So that's an example of how then you then you stitch them back together in something that you know tells a, a more unified story. Oh, this is really great. What can you all think of uh, as, as some things that you might like to try e uh, experience mapping on? In other words, what experiences that you guys uh, either have or are interested in might be interested to map the, uh, interesting to map this way? Yeah. I think the university itself would be a great project for experience mapping, both for parents and for students to be, and for students and for moms. You can see how diff they totally have different needs and, and uh, expectations and, and the way the experience could be for them. A very rich yeah. thing to map. Wildly different, actually. That yeah. it's, it's one of the ones that has it. But how about some other things? Yeah. I think Apple is a great example of a company who's obviously done experience mapping. From like the retail stores, the experience of purchasing the product, the support experience. Right. I love that they exist in the world, by the way. Absolutely. I love, because it's like, it's, it's taking the argument about whether you do this or not. Right. Whether it matters or not. Right, right, right. You right. know, I just had, I just had the, the CMO, a real marketing person, for one of the biggest credit card issuing companies in the world, ask me, really, well, what is the value of a visual identity? Right. What's the value of it? Right. right. And I was shocked. Right. Like <laughs> I couldn't believe it, because he's, he, lives, he works in a world where recognition... Right. And confidence right. are the only. They're the only, only thing that matters to him. Right. There is no. That everything else that actually happens is out of sight of the. Thing. Thing. The only right. thing that matters was how he looks. Right. And consistently looks. Right. And you know. And, and so I was able to actually pull up. If you read the the Jobs biography, Isaacson has extracted this paper that one of his colleagues wrote. The three principles of Apple marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, the first one was, um, it. It matters that it's, the craft is right, right? Because mm -hmm. even if you don't see it, it has to be right, right, right. right? The second one was something about... That from his dad. Yeah, from his dad, right? right. The second one we was... We read that in, in, in this course as well. ...was focus, yeah. was around do the things you do. Don't get off track by the things. We're going we're to focus and, and be singular things. things. 
And the third one was that notion of impute. That in communications, and it's kind of an awkward word, right. but that they would, if, you, if, you, if your communications and the store, the website, whatever, is shoddy, people will impute that it's shoddy. Right, 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 right. And if it's brilliant, they will impute that. Right, so right, right. this notion of that really intrinsic to them was that what they project is what you want to feel. Right, right. right. So I had to kind of convince this guy at this credit card company that, is astonishing. that what he he wants to impute is that confidence and, and consistency. Right. And Easy now as he's moving to be more technologically enabled, that because a lot of transactions are moving from the physical to the digital, right. that he needs to create a visual language right, right, that right, imputes right. that same kind of credibility. Right, right. right? So that's, yeah, what said. That's, that's what he said. That's what he said. Right, right. <laughs> well, it makes it makes tons of sense that um, you know I hadn't I, I thought about the first part of your example that how could somebody who's in the business of having a cu plastic card that has the logo on it and almost nothing else? I mean, it doesn't. The only thing you know about your dealings with that yeah, is I, that it be consistent and that it looks like that. Yeah. That, that's why it was a little bit shocking. But, but the principles, though, of, of how of, of experiencing an entity and the way that it's, it's very, you know, you see it, you feel it, sometimes you hear it, you taste it. You know, right. the sensory elements of that is another filter, another layer of this that, you know, for them, it's very limited. Right, 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 right. Very limited. And, and in a hotel, it's not limited. It's, you have all senses engaged yeah, yeah, no, in the experience, right? And so oftentimes, an element of this mapping idea is which sensory elements right. will be part of this experience, and right. you have to think about them. Right. Now, music right. and sound and lighting are always part of an experience, but it's not because we want a great lighting grid. Right. It's what do you want people to feel at right. this part of the place? Right, right. right. No, that's really good. And also, it, it reminds me that for so many brands probably right now, I mean, this seems obvious, but I'm not really in that world, the migration, for example, let's say, of Visa to Visa on my phone is a... That's who the company is, by the way. Uh, <laughs> there's, like, there's like three, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, to Visa on my phone is, wow, that's a huge thing fraught with promise and tremendous peril. They've built yeah. up tremendous identity around the card. And everybody's used to how it works, and they're comfortable with all of those things. And now, if they don't switch well to the phone, it's really a, a potential oh, hazard. Exactly. I mean, that, that they get that right, um, yeah. and that's where they're going slow a little bit with that. Yeah. Yeah. But the idea of technology changing the brands and changing people—it's it's funny how some companies are so thinking about technology is I'm going to change my brand by bringing technology to something, mm -hmm. and other companies are doing technology as kind of an afterthought. And don't actually, really, it's changing who they are, but don't talk about it or think about it. You know, Walmart is one of those companies, right? So Walmart has the most energy efficient stores in the world mm -hmm, mm -hmm. By, by a long shot. Right, and I have for a while. And have for a while. Yeah. Because for them, energy efficiency is about low cost. Right, they can right. keep their prices lower if their costs are lower. Right. There, you know, there used to be a big sign on the wall until I actually had them repaint the office that said, low cost equals low price, because they were all driven right, by this right. idea of low cost. But the funny thing is, all these tech, you know, they're pushing that envelope every day, more and more and more. And, I, and there's a funny, there's an engineer who works for Walmart who's in, char in charge of this program of energy efficiency. Right. And he scoffs at being sustainable. Right. right? Scoffs at, you know, he's the most sustainable footprint of any <laughs> retail in the world, right? <laughs> scoffs at it, says, no, it's about efficiency. And then he talks about the t things they do that are pushing the envelope of that. They, for fluorescent lighting, they're developing a switching technology that turns on and off the lights so that they're really only using energy 50% of the time. But the luminosity doesn't change because of the way the, the, you know, the, the fluorescent chemicals in the, in the bulbs actually remain, keep that remain excited, excited, excited right? right? Yeah. Reduce, and then you have you know, 3,000 stores, you know, 7,000 or 8,000 stores worldwide. They bring that, they're using half, they will, they're going to get to the, using half the energy they're using in fluorescent lights. We're already kind of efficient. So, right, right, but, he, right, right. but he's funny about it. He says, yeah, we're, and as soon as we figure out how it not, doesn't drive people into epileptic fits, we're going to roll it out <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but, there, but there again, you know, the, 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 like, like the credit card guys right. are pushing technology to be in the front of what they do. It's going to talk about it. And some companies, it's what they do, right. but they don't feel like it's part of it. Right, right. That's interesting. 
some other experience mapping possibilities. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, certainly, and I, I think uh, it's a. I mean, it's a. Great Airlines example. are great. I mean, yeah. I've I've had the opportunity to do two airline experience project one for United before the merger, which didn't get done, mm -hmm. and then Delta Airlines when they um, emerged from bankruptcy, mm -hmm. and the experience mapping of that was the most fun thing, and it's really fun to see it coming to life now too, because it takes years for this to come. So, we um, we developed this idea in a in a in a category where you almost can't do anything because of the constraints around cost and labor unions and security yeah. and physics of flying right, and right, right. so many things you can't do. Um, so we actually used a, a way of taking elements of the experience and putting them out of context to create an innovative feel. Right. Right? So at Delta now, which I'm so proud of this, is that we came up with this idea of club gates. Right, right, right. So rather yeah. than the lounge experience only being for the, you know, the high paying flyers, We've taken all those amenities and, and, and put them out by the gate. And all these drawings of, you know, all these little things we have at the gate. And now you go to LaGuardia and to JFK and all these Delta airline places, the gates themselves wow. are really turning into something very unique, right? And the hope is that, now, how, I, okay, I, but I have a question there. Um, airlines are, are notoriously, people buy airline tickets notoriously on these aggregator websites that, a, yeah. whose only criterion is the lowest cost. How, do, how does that work then? With, with well, there are people that fly low cost, that most people fly low mm -hmm. cost, and, and it doesn't really matter as much. I mean, you're trying to build preference in small ways right. so that you know, small percentages will actually want to fly this airline more because of those amenities. It's right. really marginal. Right. It's really about the premium flyers. It matters much more for business travelers. Who are, yeah, it's really about that. And people who are like, in the middle of that, it's like these gates now became trying to take that down to the next tier of travel to make it you know, a little bit more preference. It's a right. lot loyalty driven and you know, points programs driven. Right. But, it's a, uh, but again, it's one of those experiences that's so immersive right, right. that it's so much not about the flying anymore. Like the, the head of Lufthansa's marketing group said, the battle for air superiority in the airline business, we fought on the ground. Right, right? Right, right, right. So, so, the, so the idea of all the amenities in the airports and, and the websites and right. the mobile apps and all those things right. that are about the pre-flying experience will be where a lot of the things are happening. Well, it makes tons of sense. I mean, actually, the stress of flying is almost all about the stuff that yeah. connects you. you know, once you get on, how many times you get on the airplane, ah, okay, I made it through, I'm on the plane. Yeah. And now, uh, mission accomplished. And now they're letting you pay for the things that take that stress away. Yeah. Their entire business model now is changing to having you pay, right. disaggregating the experience, right, right, and right, selling right. it to you bit by right, bit. Right, right. At the kiosk. <laughs> right. 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 Speaking of which, Virgin, Air, Virgin is, has been kind of an innovator, it seems to me, here, yeah. right? Because they disaggregated that experience and said, what are the pieces that we can innovate around given that? in the security sequence and all the rest, there are things over which we, we have little control. Um, are, they, are they one of the, like for example, you know, they would, there's, I, I remember them advertising, uh, uh, driving you to the airport, uh, get, having the experience, you know, there's disaggregating the experience so you realize, oh wait a minute, here's the chunk that we're not right. dealing with from your house to the airport. How about that, we make that, that kind of thinking, branded? Right? The, yeah. pre, the pre part of the experience that they, you know, went out and found some interesting things. Yeah, they're, they're definitely one of the admired, you know, airlines in the experience field. Right, right. Yeah. But that's a great one. That's a really, so many parts of that. It, it's very rich. Right. What else? Yeah, Paul. Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point, actually. Um, that, that it's part of your life. You really, you know, you really understand it every day. Yeah, so that's, that's a good one. Well, the, and, and the idea that, um, Bring, putting those two things together was at more than uh, was more than just the value of each of them uh, apart. I, I, I think that makes lots of sense. Um, By the way, that is actually something. Either you you pick an experience that you want to find out something about, mm. and you go on, or you do one that you know a lot about that mm -hmm. you can kind of go deeper and richer on each of the mm -hmm. aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and how many people in here go skiing? Okay. Now, is, there, is that a situation that is ripe for improvement? Um, in other words, if you disaggregate all the experiences associated with going skiing, uh, I did so recently and I, you know, I, I, I thought at the last minute I realized, oh my gosh, I don't have ski gloves. I don't, you know, my son has stolen my ski gloves. I have to get some more ski gloves. And, um, but I didn't realize it until I'd already left 
the confines of the world of competition, uh, uh, store competition in, in the Boston metro area. And once I, and I was in the realm of the, you know, $700 pair of, <laughs> of gloves, it wasn't that bad. But, you know, the point is that there are all these pieces of that experience that you can imagine that they could be uh, linked together much better. Um, others? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They're one of the, again, they, they understand that extremely well. And they do that well. And they're one of the ones in this next phase, you see they're redoing all their stores to be more local now. You know, yeah. They're really trying to make them be more of the neighborhood as yeah. opposed to the Starbucks standard. Right. And so they're well down the road of, of, of implementing that idea. Yeah. Huh. No, that's a, that's a really good point because in, in many ways, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. The, uh, I, I'm being reminded that we should, um, we should um, repeat the questions because we're not handing out the microphone. So uh, your point about Starbucks, um, they are, um, uh, that's really what you're paying for, of course. And that's, what the, that's the revolution of their business model is, I think I saw a cartoon years ago um, that showed uh, a 25 cent cup of coffee. Believe it or not, there was a time when that's how much a cup of coffee <laughs> cost. And then it showed Starbucks business model, which was to charge 250 for that same thing. And at, on, on the face of it, that sounds inane. Why on earth would anybody pay for that? But they're not really paying for that, probably. They're paying for an experience. It's uh, the, it is, again, I'm glad they exist in right. the world. Because uh, if you're trying to explain to people what, why brands matter to a client or companies, right. it's that right. idea right. of an unbranded cup of coffee. It's a dollar, dollar right. fifty, right. and right. they're four dollars now. Right. Um, and it's, it's because of brand. It, you, right. you, you're paying more for a given amount. Right. The other way would be that you'd pay, the, you, you'd pay a lot, you'd do it many, many more times right. at a given price, right? That is the entire reason why brand exists as a, as a, a function, func as a business. Right. Although there's no other reason to right. pay more or buy more. That's right. really the whole thing. Right. Yeah. So the question is about, or the observation is about um, experiences, I would say, maybe rather than brands. Experiences that over, over which the, the company does not have control at all right. stages, like Amazon or what was your other Or example? TSA at airports, same, yeah. same kind of thing. Where there, you know, the part you control means you have to do it you know, a lot better or figure out ways to get around some of those things or be really good at mitigating those issues that once they've, you know, something comes ripped up in the mail. Of course, you get a new one right back. Doesn't cost right. anything extra. Those kinds right. of things. Well, actually, there is a company that's very well known for doing this, and I'm sure there are people in this room who know about Zappos, right? The the online shoe uh, people, whose whole premise is that we will reduce all of the stuff that might occur between our warehouse and your house. Um, we'll we have systems in place. Now, for example. Online, you get with your order a complete kit for easily returning. You're not using up your whole morning trying to figure out who to address it to, how much does it weigh, and so forth. They, you know, the smart companies have that right there, so you like flip over the the bill, and it, there's an adhesive strip on the back of it. You plant it right on the same box. It goes back, and you've spent five minutes that is only a tiny bit longer than you would have spent maybe even if you were buying it in person, except you have access to 50,000 shoes instead of 50. So, so that's, that's, a, that's good. Other, yeah. Uh, sorry, this guy's question. Um, how, how do you attack this beast of uh, understanding and developing this map? Um, and how long would that take? So the, que the, the question is, how do you go about making the map in the first place? Well, I think the, the first step is to imagine or observe the experience and understand what the important parts are, right? So it's a really observational 
could be ethnographically mm -hmm. researched, or just if you sit there and think about what you do mm -hmm. when you have an experience. You know, I'm going to the movies. That's what I Okay, mean. so I kind of go online first and see what's playing at the local place. I see what times they are. Right, so that website for that, you know, thing is really important. Now, if I'm the theater, I don't control that at all. Right. So, okay, so I know that's going to be a small part of the customer experience, but a big part for where you go. When I get to the, I get to the theater, is there a place to park? How is parking, or how is the sign to find where the theater is? So do I you know, go through all the things in kind of a little bit fanatic kind of way, all the specific steps. Now, when I'm, do I stand in line? Do I buy my ticket? If I bought the ticket before. Does a kiosk work where I pick up my ticket? Do I have to go in line mm -hmm. to buy a ticket? You know, do I see the time? Do I reduce the anxiety of am I going to find a seat? Are there right. ways that you modulate the feeling of that? There's, right. you know, concession, the transportation within the, th you know, all these things become things that you would do become the beginning of that. Sometimes there are big research projects that actually feed into what that is, but oftentimes it's very much common sense driven. This is really related to our, you, you all remember our guest Mark Meyer from the business school, and he talked about latent needs as opposed to expressed needs. And this was really, Mark is one of those almost frighteningly effective um, uh, market researchers, and you know, he's the guy who's probably behind uh, that girl um, finding out from Target that she was pregnant. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that he's, he must be involved in this research somehow. Um, but um, he was talking about uh, um, re something that you are as well. This, this, and it re really brings uh, power to this word empathy. It's not just putting yourself in the other's shoes in a kind of uh, abstract way. But it's really the idea of, of what, it, what it feels like, the whole, whole idea of anxiety. Who knew that anxiety was an explicit performance component of going to the movies, let's say? Mm -hmm. Like, it would be very easy to just skip over that altogether. But in fact, it might be a determiner of whether you'll go or not. I've had a hard day. I don't need more anxiety. I'm not going to go do something that involves my not being sure if I'll get a seat, have to go to a later show. You know what? To hell with it. I'll just stay home. But this could be a real driver, I think. Uh, yeah, the feelings aspect of, of that mapping process, how would you want people to feel? It'd be, you know, the, the generative elements of mapping to so what to do. It's also a diagnostic utility of a map like that, where you actually, right, what's wrong? Like how do people feel now mm. when they're doing this, right? right? And right. you see where the, the really interesting friction points are in a journey, so you know what, what to actually really spend time on, or right. what you need to innovate around, or... You know, it has both a tool, it's a tool for, you know, coming up with ideas, but also right. just in a very systematic way looking at experiences. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think there are a user's experience in a hospital. Um, it's like a separate, you know, um, emergency needs and visitors. And yeah. So the, the question is about, um, about mapping experience in a hospital. I think it's a great example, which not unlike the university right. has wildly different. Uh, these are not. These are. This is not like the uh, the hotel in Vegas, where the only difference is whether you're gambling or not. This is a much bigger. Really rich. Uh, I know, um, and you mentioned IDEO earlier. Who worked? On, they did a, a recent project on that, mm -hmm. where they use a kind of a mapping technique like this too. I mean, they. they I don't know if they call it that or what, but there's a way. And I know they've done a really in-depth analysis of the patient experience in, mm -hmm. in some, for some health care provider. I, I saw it written about it. It was really quite good. So it's something that I, I think people know. That's a big problem. It's right. a very big problem to attack. Like I, I, I'm part of this organization, Society of Environmental Graphic Design, right. and we did a joint venture project with the Robert Woods Johnson Foundation on wayfinding in hospitals. Right. And it was a fascinating study because you think, uh, you know, you put up an icon and, you know, People don't speak English, put icon, but you know the icons themselves are so culturally charged that many times the Hispanic or the Asian uh, patients Has no had idea. no context what that icon means, which was very normal in, in sort of a you know American Western culture context. Mm -hmm. So the researching of more universal icons to just make that part of the anxiety of knowing when to go to right. hospital right. Right. easier it was a huge project and a very interesting one about. Getting beyond your presumptions, right, right, right. A lot of this mapping technique 
is about getting beyond your own presumptions right, about right. the experience right. and understanding where the opportunities are to make things better right. or different right. or, or more effective. Right. So if the problem in that case was why are our, some of our citizens in this community X not making use of hospital services that are currently available? This is not a public policy problem of not having, no, we've provided the services, but this community and this community aren't availing themselves of them. Why would this be? And the ethnographic research or, or whatever teases out, uh-oh, wait a second. Actually, there's 40% of the population that is afraid of going to the hospital because of the following bad things that can happen. Right. And exactly. if you can assuage those anxieties. You know, just and as evidence, this has been slowly taking over the healthcare world a little bit at a time. But uh, one, I would say, success story is that there are now these things called birthing centers at a lot of hospitals, which did not used to be the case. In other words, pregnancy used to be treated pretty much the same as a heart attack or <laughs> some terrible, unexpected thing that had befallen you, when in fact it was actually fairly anticipatable after a certain uh, sequence of events. And um, so the idea that you were not actually ill and that you were not r requiring you know, to be in a laboratory setting, but they, they created these centers for women to give birth in that were actually much more about not being anxious and not looking like you were, had just had a heart attack and not looking like you had the same environment as someone who was about to die, <laughs> but rather that, 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 that and, they, and that was really remade from a kind of user yeah. uh, perspective, I think. And I mean, somebody might have been asked, you know, hey, we need to design a new a maternity wing. Right. Let's design a maternity wing. Right. But if you, the aspiration element of that, well, what are you really trying to do? Are right. you trying to make it a better place to give birth? Right, right, right. right. It's a different question than what the, you know, the maternity wing is like. Right. So that kind of empathetic approach or outside-in approach or something has been, in terms of problem-solving design, I found very useful in this commercial branding sense. Right. But it always kind of, you know, I, I wish I could have backfilled into my architectural education. Right. Right. Just problem solving, you know, that that uh, that sort of point of view. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Well, uh, I'm sorry. One more. So the, so the question is about conscious versus subconscious needs of, of users, and what are and so you're asking, what are some examples of, of how companies do this? Yeah, well, research is one way, right? And and I I tend not to try to delve in the world of the subconscious. Mm. You know, I think it gets a little bit too presumptive if you're really thinking about the subconscious elements of this. And, and it's very difficult like, to design around the subconscious. Mm. The result will definitely have some subconscious results. And you kind of hope the best on that in a way. Right, 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 right. But you can really research, even if it's not subconscious, unspoken right, right. needs. And a lot of that is observational. Well, I mean, a lot of this work is about, yes, awakening something, usually it's desire, mm -hmm. right? Wanting to be part of it, wanting to be there, wanting to pick that up, wanting to, you know, this notion of desire that's kind of underlying a lot of this work as the subconscious effect, I guess. But we're trying to be pretty, you know, uh, conscious about the elements that would drive that. And when we find out things um, about behavior, either ob observational or stated or sometimes derived, Right? There are testing methodologies that allow you to derive people's choice, how they make choices, by just having them make a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. And then you extract from that kind of pattern of choices what actually they really want as opposed to what they say they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That, that would get more observational in her behavior. You know, what other things she was buying and, and looking up actually drove them to send her things around maternity. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes it's even... Um, Getting people to make to understand their choices, because stated stated choices are are, are dubious. I mean, people say that they want. Uh, you know, the very famous uh, Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell, um, 
uh, TED talk about spaghetti sauce. Mm. And the, 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 uh, the, 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 go find this, by the way, because it's really about happiness. Mm. Mm. But he uses this, this idea of this researcher who was researching spaghetti sauce and coffee. One of the things about coffee, people will always say they like a strong, dark roast of coffee, right? It is not true. People <laughs> like a watery, kind of milky coffee. <laughs> but when it asks a question in a survey, people will say, I like a dark roast, yeah. bold coffee. And so the way that questioning and getting, it's not going to get you to the answer what you want. Right. It's actually observational or giving people lots of choices and seeing where they make their choices subconsciously. I mean, in the way they are making subconscious choices, but you're not really trying to get into the subconscious. I mean, that's a, that's, there's, there is like a neurological research methodology now that's making its way into the world that's interesting about brain activity and stimuli. And if you look at something and it creates brain activity, People are assuming that's good, <laughs> right, right. And, uh, and, and a lot of uh, testing and advertising is being done now neurologically, which is kind of right. interesting. But right. that, way, that way, that's the subconscious, tapping the subconscious a little bit more. Just, but again, it's physical, it's the brain activity there, as opposed to their subconscious. As opposed to you're trying to infer. Idea. Yeah. 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 We're going to have to wrap it up here. Thank you, okay. Peter Dixon, very much. <laughs>